you're left lost, you're left empty, bewildered, you're left, you know, with a terrible emptiness, heartbroken, heartbroken. And every mother was heartbroken. Hi, I'm Sheila O'Byrne and I'm a survivor of St. Patrick's Mother and Baby Home Institution, for which it was, Navan Road, Cabra, Dublin. Actually, 381 Navan Road, Cabra, Dublin. The mother, it starts with the mother and that we, we are actually the real survivor who was left in the building where we were incarcerated because we broke the original sin and had a baby out of wedlock. But we were punished for that crime because we broke the original sin. Sheila describes how the nuns treated women who were pregnant. One of them actually said to me, never tell anyone you were here, you're damaged goods. You will never be accepted in society because of the wrong that you have done. That's why it was so silent, you keep it silent. I was 19, 19. That's what I actually believed, because that's what the way it, the, it, was, it was put into you, that you, you did a wrong. You did wrong, and you to be punished for it, which we were punished when we were incarcerated in there. I mean, I witnessed so much, uh, for the, you know, as a mother in there, I witnessed the vaccine trials. The babies couldn't. I can, because I'm the living witness. I'm also a witness to an illegal adoption because I was made go a little one and watch her go. And another nun, which was a daughter of a charity, said to me, now, Sheila, she said, this will get you ready for when it's your turn. Off you pop now, back to your work. I couldn't let her see that that was hurting me because that little one got attached to me. But I was glad to see, you know, that she was getting out of the building. Sheila describes the conditions the women were forced to live in. The building was a very, it was big, it was horrible, it was cold. Cold. And you worked, you worked hard. You, everyone had a job. But they made sure you worked. You were up at the crack of dawn. And um, as I said, I, I used to, I, I looked after the sick and the dying babies. And every time I went up, a little one was gone. The cot was empty. And I knew that poor unfortunate's gone. They were very ill, the babies I looked after. Very ill. And I always remember them. I always see them. I still see them. That's why I always stand up for the babies in the illegal burial grounds. The living bereavement are the mothers that were not allowed be at the burial of their baby, of their flesh and blood. They weren't allowed. That choice, that, that choice was taken from the mother to not to be allowed present at the burial of their baby, of their flesh and blood. And that's, that's at night, this was always at night. And they couldn't even use coffins. They had to use orange boxes. They hadn't got the dignity to, to give them a coffin. Because the way they saw us, they were nothing. And the mothers were nothing, we were only dirt. And in, in their eyes, even, even now we're still dirt to them. The women who were locked up because they were pregnant outside of wedlock were treated very badly, particularly those whose children had died. God loved them. I used to listen to them at night, screaming and roaring and broken hearted. The mothers were broken hearted. Their babies, they didn't give their babies up at all. The mothers had a heart because of the, the baby was taken, their flesh and blood, and so cruelly told to their babies when they're looking for them, the nuns saying that their babies, the, the mothers didn't care. The mothers did care. They cared. That choice wasn't given to the mother. Anyway, where were they to go? There was nowhere to go. There was no support, there was nothing. Nothing at all. 
nothing. Sheila recalls some of the people who were in the home with her. I said I remember the little one who was, uh, she was 11 and she was expecting twins. But that little one died. Yeah, I don't forget that girl. She was just dumped in there. Nobody cared. Nobody, how did she get pregnant? Nobody cared. No justice. Nothing done about it because as far as they were concerned, she was a piece of trash. And we were only trash. And that's how we were treated, as trash. Pregnant and without their families, the women earned their keep. It was hard. Like, I mean, you had to, I mean, there was a lot of washing. I mean, I used to have to take the washing from from the hospital, all the, you know, the, and take it over. Me and another girl would have a, we had, a, you know, they had the tin bats, and we'd bring it over and we'd wash them in the bats upstairs, down on, down on your knees with a washboard and the red soap. And uh, if it was raining, you put them on the wooden, clothes horses and if it wasn't you put them out, out on the clothes line out the back but we used to have to strip the dormitories everything we did absolutely everything no amount of sickness or sadness would stop the nuns from making the women work yeah and i had the shingles and they didn't care i had the shingles i was really sore now i was bad but they didn't they didn't care about me they didn't give a damn you had to do your work. You paid your penance for that one. But um, the work was hard. A lot of us like down on the hands and knees, scrubbing the floors, polishing, um, uh, handling the food. Like I used to come out of the nursery after looking after the babies and washing. I did everything for the babies because I cared about them. At least I showed them that I loved them where others didn't which uh, some were very hard, were heartless, and I don't know how, to be honest with you, that they allowed them to look after a human being. An animal was treated better, and I have to say that, because it's the way, it, it is the truth, I'm speaking here. Racism was rife in the institutions. But as I said now, when it comes to uh, me, because I had a mixed race child, that was a different story. They deprived me of washing my own clothes. My daddy used to come to me every Tuesday with, with, the wash, with fresh clothes to me. I washed everybody else's, bar me on. Because I, I suppose, because I wasn't carrying the, the, the white baby, I was carrying a different color. And they made you feel that. They made you feel you're nothing but dirt. Sheila asked her son's father for help, but he wasn't forthcoming. She insists, though, that her family did not put her in the home. They had been duped by the nuns that their daughter had shamed their family and community. The father wasn't interested, you know what I mean? Didn't help you? Didn't. I tried to do something, but nothing could be done about it. I mean, I couldn't go home because of the shame, because of the neighbours, because Everyone was made out that this is a terrible thing. You were blacklisted because of it. You were smeared, you were everything, you were nothing. You were only trash. And anyone that did did become pregnant or wedlock was only trash. And they'll always be trash. Sheila felt hopeless because she had to give her son up. I, I wanted to keep my son. I didn't want to give my son up. But I couldn't say nothing because I knew I wasn't my place. I, I'd know where to go. Where was I to go? Especially with a mixed race child. You wouldn't stand a chance if I stood in the canals, maybe. You know, but I wouldn't have survived. Who's going to give you a job? No one, because you were shamed to everybody. In, in, in society, you were shamed. You, you, they wouldn't accept you to say, oh, that. So we can't take you in here. She recalls the day she signed his adoption papers. Anthony, well, it was a full year nearly there. Anthony was three months, because I wasn't, I wasn't long. I was very sick from, this, from the time I became pregnant. And 
I had to go so quick. I wasn't even a week and I was gone because people would have noticed. So I had to go very, very quickly. So I was there, there for a long time, there for a good year. I was thinking, God, I, what, I can't do anything about this. What am I, I can't keep you, it was killing me. I wasn't letting them see it was killing me because they that's what they want to see, the nuns. Sheila recalls the day she signed her son's adoption papers. Uh, I got a, a, a note to say that you have to call up to up to Temple Hill. So I called up and they were still at it in there. This time it was only, only looking, no touching. And I said, Anthony, I have to put you before me. I don't have a choice. I had to I had to go home empty handed. I have to secure you. It's breaking me heart because I can't go home w with you. But I know you're going to make it in life. But I don't have a choice because I've nothing. I nowhere to go. It killed me, I, and I couldn't talk to anyone. You couldn't speak to anyone at all. I was so empty, and when I walked out of that building, Temple Hill. And I walked out of there and got on that bus and no one you can't speak to anyone about it. And I said, I, then I went into South Ann Street, up to the solicitor, and you said, sit there. And she came over, she didn't say, there was nobody there to say, well, I can help you. We can do this for you. Nobody. Just sign there, sign there. And that's it. And that nearly killed me. You're left lost, you're left empty, bewildered. You're left, you know, with a terrible emptiness. Heartbroken. Heartbroken. And every mother was heartbroken because they were never given a choice at all. None of the mothers were. As I said, I used to hear them crying at night in the dormitory. I remember another girl and she's saying to me, Oh, my baby died. I said, but did you see our baby? No. I said, where's the baby then? Said, there has to be something. No, she was just told it's gone to the angels. Sheila searched for her son for 41 years. He was trying to look contact me too. He was delighted. It was 41 years of a search. And I'm glad we met. Sheila now writes poems to express her feelings. This is one of my poems and these are all documented because it tells the truth. Forget me not, don't leave us here. Sentenced by church and state. Don't leave me here, their voices I can hear them. Please don't leave me here. Get me out where I'll be known and call me by my real name, call it out loud. So the whole world will know that we are hidden in the unmarked graves. The high grass that is over us, some flat grass as well. Don't leave us here, we need to get out, placed where everyone will see us and they can say hello. Please come and find us, the whole world needs to be told. We broke the sin by church and state, we deserve to be discovered. DNA and found, place us in the holy sacred ground. And just before you finish, Alison, I'd like to say I stand with Anna O'Gorman, just like you do, for to get the marking of baby, of angel baby Evan O'Gorman, who was 48 years of age. And Anne, as we know, Anne is ill, and, you know, uh, Hopefully, before her time comes, that Anne will get justice to get the marking of baby Evelyn O'Gorman in Bespera Mother and Baby Home, Black Rock, Cork, in the illegal burial grounds. I leave it there. <laughs>